welcome to MPS Neighborhood, a community space for MPS students, families, and community members to learn, listen, and grow. My name is Derek Francis, and I'm the manager of counseling services for Minneapolis Public Schools. I'm also a father, a son, and a lifelong resident uh, of the Twin Cities. past year has been unlike any we've witnessed here in the city, uh, recently with the murder of George Floyd. And now we have a moment to uh, create spaces to reflect on our past year and start preparing ourselves for the upcoming weeks. I want to begin by acknowledging that Minneapolis Public Schools is on native Dakota land. Uh, Minneapolis Public Schools is committed to an ongoing effort to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian uh, students, families, and community members. I love living here in the Twin Cities. Uh, here's some of the things that I enjoy while uh, having free time. I enjoy music, prints. When you think of Minneapolis, Twin Cities, that's what people think about. Juicy Lucy's, I love a great burger. Uh, the State Fair, uh, Lakes, Bade Makaska, my favorite one. Uh, those are the things that we think about and uh, places we enjoy together as Minnesotans, as people in Minneapolis. And so I think it's important that we commune together in so many different areas, that it's important that we find time to have hope and unity. And so here's our plan for today to uh, grow towards that. This is a starting point. And so our time today is to help us learn strategies to better understand our feelings and emotions that we've experienced over the past year. We're going to learn some proactive personal strategies to navigate feelings and emotions connected to the upcoming trial verdict. Uh, also, we're going to talk about strategies to combat racism, and then we're going to learn how to be supportive and inclusive uh, to all people in our community. That's part of our vision uh, here in Minneapolis Public Schools. And so I want to make sure that uh, we're mindful that we do anticipate that the jury will be reaching a decision this week uh, in a Derek Chauvin trial. Uh, and so Derek Chauvin will be found either guilty or not guilty for the charges below, which are second degree unintentional murder, third degree murder, uh, second degree manslaughter. To kick us off uh, with a message of hope, I would like to introduce the Attorney General of Minnesota, Keith Ellison. Take it away, Mr. Ellison. Hello everyone, this is Keith Ellison and I'm your Attorney General in the state of Minnesota. And I'm leading the prosecution in the case against Derek Chauvin, the man responsible for the death of George Floyd. I want you to know that that video, you just can't unsee it. It's heartbreaking. And every time I see it, it upsets me and makes me feel great compassion for George Floyd and the people who are on the sideline watching, trying to get the officers to help him. Your feelings are completely understandable. You're entitled to them. And I'm so glad that you care so much because if you didn't care, our society would never get better. It's because of your concern and your compassion that we have a chance to have a society where everybody can be treated with dignity and respect. That video has us all hurting. And what happened to George Floyd has us all hurting. But this is an opportunity for us to show compassion for ourselves and each other. There is a path forward. We have brought the case. This is not the end of the collective struggle toward justice, regardless of the trial outcome. The fact is, is that it is important for us to take care of each other and ourselves and to make sure that we are looking out for each other. That's what it means to live in a compassionate society, which we all want. So by working together, Minneapolis and Brooklyn Center and our entire community can be a wonderful example to the world of healing, reconciliation, and growth. But we need you to help lead us there. So be a leader, be strong in this very difficult moment, and understand that we see you. We really do. So thank you, all the best. It is important that we understand the impact of our mental and physical well-being over the past year. We have been living through a global pandemic for over a year. We've also experienced periods of civil unrest. We've also seen times where uh, people in our communities and globally, such as Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and then locally then, Philando Castile, Jamar Clark, George Floyd, and now Dante Wright being murdered. Many of us have lost family members from the pandemic and COVID-19, 
and some have even lost family members from the pandemic and racism. So it's important that we understand and acknowledge that some of us are experiencing so many losses at this time. Many of us are hurting. And some of us have been experiencing this for the entire past year. To prepare for conversations for the upcoming trial, let's take a peek at this clip from WCCO, which features my friend and colleague, Michael Walker. And uh, the city is preparing itself, right? And one thing that we know that the city is doing is they're preparing different um, physical aspects of our community so that it can be safe. And so we're saying, how can we use those same tactics that the city is doing for physical safety, for our mental and emotional safety? And so one thing that they're doing is using barricades, right? So barricades is really to um, limit access to certain areas and creating these safe zones. And one way that we can barricade our mental uh, state and our emotional state is to uh, not be so glued to the TVs and the media outlets to have to watch this uh, trial go on 24 seven. So we can uh, make sure that we're taking time out for ourselves that we're not just inundated with all this information and all these uh, these things that can trigger some uh, traumatic experiences for some people. There are detoured routes that the city has kind of set up, you know, to make sure people are able to move around safely and uh, protest safely. And you think maybe we all need to think about what our detours will be too, right? For sure, for sure. I mean, on a day to day basis, we'll come in contact with so many different people, whether it be at work, whether it be in the community. And sometimes we know where some people stand on certain topics and certain um, aspects. And so uh, how do we make sure that we're not engaging in all those conversations? So how can we find uh, routes where we can avoid some of those conversations and some of those uh, uh, spaces that we may not want to be in at certain times because our mental state isn't uh, isn't there already? And so it's really intentional that we find these detoured routes and avoiding uh, certain spaces with certain people. Thanks so much, Michael, for those strategies and suggestions in this key time. Uh, I want to piggyback off of some of the things that Michael shared. Uh, it's really important that we're taking care of ourselves, taking care of our uh, selves first, knowing what things we need. And so, uh, as my mom tells me, guard my heart, guard my mind. And so I'm being mindful of who my supports are. Uh, my family is that for me, uh, close friends, uh, co-workers, my neighbors even. And so just knowing who are those people for you. And then also knowing what things you can do to maintain yourself, to take care of yourself. So some of us, it might be doing our hobbies that we enjoy. It's getting nicer out. So get out for a walk. There's no excuse. Take the dog for a walk. Take the kids to the park. Mow the lawn. Fire up the grill. I know I'm going to be putting some beef ribs on the grill with a nice glaze. Those things get us excited. I love that. Listen to music. Enjoy just being around people who build you up. Be mindful of those environments uh, that are more supportive. I think it's important for us to get an understanding and of history of protests in our country. Uh, and protests have been a part of our country since the very beginning. Some of the protests, as you see pictured here, uh, that have happened in our country is the Great American Boycott, which was put together by immigrant workers. Uh, the Stonewalls Riots, which fought for lesbian, gay, and human rights. Uh, and then there was the Women's March in 2017. Check out this video for more information. So how important has protest been in making America what it promised to be? It's fundamental. It's important to kind of define what we mean by protest. <laughs> queer existence, at least visible queer existence, is in and of itself protest. How do marginalized groups like women, like African Americans, get a voice in this nation? It's through protest. Rebellion broke out five years before the Revolutionary War. Six years before independence was officially declared. All of the issues that we're still <laughs> grappling with now were an issue in the American Revolution. What is the place of black people? And what is the place of women in the country and people who do not necessarily fit the mold. The way they spoke about their freedom while at the same time keeping blacks enslaved um, here was sort of a conflicting um, uh, conundrum. The protests following the murder of George Floyd last summer in Minneapolis and around the world went down as one of the largest demonstrations ever recorded. We know many students and families in the metro area were impacted by the smell of smoke and hearing helicopters each night and even seeing the fires and flames in the streets. But also there's an emotional pain of seeing the racial violence towards people in our community. I know uh, one of our closest schools in the area, less than a mile away uh, from where demonstrations took place. Uh, so my heart's with the students and families in the community. 
And not only that, I know that uh, students, they have reactions. The students listening and checking this out, you have views and opinions about what's been going on in our city. And I think it's important that we hear you. Uh, I have a two-year-old, uh, so she's young, but I know when she gets older, I plan to have conversations with her. And so I know youth out there, you want to have space to have talking points around these things. So let's check out this video uh, to hear how the youth are feeling. Psychologists say parents should help kids talk about what they're seeing. But it's hard even for me with my son. From the time he was little to now as a teenager, I've struggled to find the right words to tell my black child about how to stay safe when he's not with me. It's important to say, you know, I can imagine how you're feeling. Sometimes I feel that way. Um, and to listen. The kids that we talk to say images like these give them hope. I think it's good that the police officers are like showing that not all police are bad. What have you learned this week? One thing I did learn is something about the American human nature and that we are capable of coming together, protesting together, and sticking up for each other. No matter your race, we must all live peacefully. Children standing up for the future they want to see. Rahima Ellis, NBC News, New York. All right, as you reflect on the video, what are some of the worries that students shared? Uh, what feelings do, if you're a student out here, what do you have like the students? Uh, and what conversation are you having with your friends uh, about the upcoming trial? And so I know that there's many uh, parents and caregivers and aunts and uncles and families, uh, TT, unk, um, I'm Uncle D, Uncle Derek. Uh, and so it's important, especially coming up with uh, students being home uh, and watching and being exposed to these different events in our city that they'll be looking for us as adults to speak, to talk, to offer our views, our opinions. And so it's really important that we are making ourselves available. And so here's some strategies in this video from an expert on some things that you can do to maximize those opportunities. First, I would recommend very, very much so trying to limit their exposure because children struggle with making sense of the things that they don't understand. Um, but letting them know that sometimes bad things do happen. Jackson stresses that this is a time to reassure your children that they're safe and protected. For older children, she says, take this time to be open and honest with them about what caused the unrest we're seeing now. Well, this is a great time to introduce the older children into kind of breaking it down and saying, well, what have you learned in school? You know, what has history taught you? Let's do a brief history lesson on policing in minority neighborhoods and policing with people of color. I appreciate the suggestions in that video. I know uh, starting early is one of the key things that I think is so important. Uh, as a parent, that's my daughter. She's two years old. Her name is Grace. Uh, I love her so much. And I know starting early uh, and being honest about uh, racism is so important because kids can understand and see uh, different aspects of racism socially. Uh, for example, uh, it's important that we combat racism right now in our country that's being experienced by Asian American communities. Many uh, reports have came out over the past year about Asian American uh, people that are experiencing discrimination in the aftermath of uh, the pandemic. And so it's important that we're combating uh, when, when we hear those things. There are so many different factors to influence our views of the trial and recent racial events in our country. For instance, what part of the city and state you are from plays a huge factor into your experiences with people from different backgrounds. It's important that we're mindful of what TV shows or TV networks we're watching and which narratives that we're hearing and maybe not hearing in this crucial time. It's important that we're aware of dinner conversations, understanding about uh, people from different backgrounds, uh, understanding some of the biases and experiences that people who we may not have ever had a dinner with, how their real life is going right now. I hope we can find ways to call out biases that might come up in those situations where we need to speak up. It's important that we're able to have these honest dialogue with ourselves to recognize what groups, which identities we may have biases towards. What are your tough spots? 
it's important that we do that personal work to address the bias that we see in ourselves, whether it's conscious or unconscious. I know I've experienced moments where I've had to call out things in my own self, maybe towards a political group, maybe towards a social economic group or racial group or religious group. And so I wanna to continue to do my own work. I want us to take a look at this short video because it gives us an idea of what bias and the look could feel like. take a moment to ask that we consider practicing humility and empathy in this crucial time. Uh, it's important that we realize that people are experiencing the recent racial tensions in our, in our community at a different level. Some people are experiencing much more of an impact than others. Some people are losing their only child uh, and it's an impact in their entire family and community. Uh, and I know there's some folks who can't really understand what it would feel like to lose someone to racial violence. So I ask that we understand that, that awareness that we're coming in from a different place, uh, but it's important that we listen to understand, that we build cross-cultural relationships. And we have that awareness of uh, humility that we don't know what it's like to uh, lose a, your only child. I wouldn't know what that's like. And then also that there's people in our communities uh, that have experienced racism and discrimination. I share this picture here because I've seen the beauty of students taking a moment to get to know uh, and empathize with each other, especially cross-culturally. And uh, this story is about two uh, high school students who were playing against each other in a football game. And uh, the, one of the students, Gage, on the right, the white student, uh, he had heard that Ty on the left, that his mother had recently been diagnosed with uh, cancer. And so Gage felt that, that humanity in his heart and said, you know what, after this game, I want to go over there and just talk to him, speak with him, hey, pray with him, and let him know that I, I feel for you as someone who understands that it would be hard to have a parent right now as you're a high schooler that is navigating uh, cancer. So I think it's so important that we take time to have humility and get to know about each other. Educators, we play a tremendous role in the weeks coming up. This is our teachable moment in history, and we have a chance to speak up. I don't care what role you play in school, whether you're a teacher, associate educator, engineer, lunch staff, coach. I hope you're ready for the opportunity to listen or lead a conversation about what's going on in our city uh, and in the world around us. Kids are watching us. They're not too young to understand what's going on. They have feelings and emotions too. Check out this video for some strategies. After the death of George Floyd uh, sparked protests and a lot of discussion there about why these protests are happening and discussions of systemic racism in our society. Um, if kids are seeing this and they're seeing these protests at this time, uh, how do you talk about, you know, if they wanna be part of that movement? 
Yeah, I think you know there's all sorts of opportunities for for kids to be involved. You know, in um, Louisville, for example, kids organized a march for Breonna Taylor, and so you can help your child organize a little neighborhood march. You can ask your kids how they want to participate. Do they want to write a letter to their legislators? Do they, um, you know, perhaps want to? create some art and um, bring it to uh, the George Floyd um, area. Whatever, whatever they feel comfortable with, there could be opportunities within the schools for um, resource groups and affinity groups to help kids process. So any way that they wanna be involved, really lean in and help. I hope that video gave you some ideas. It's important that we provide opportunities in schools for students to express themselves, express how they're feeling, whether through artwork or poetry or music uh, or conversations in small groups, in affinity spaces. It's important that we're providing spaces for students to speak. Here's some examples of artwork that's been done by students uh, in the past year in response to uh, the racial incidents in our community. It's so important that as educators, parents, caregivers, guardians, that we empower kids to speak up when they hear discrimination, racism, or bias. If you're a student listening in, I encourage you to take a listen to some of these strategies, to have the words to speak up. Uh, one example that you can use in the coming weeks and moving forward is, hey, that comment you made about Black people or Latinx people or poor people or people who live in small towns, that's not okay with me. It hurts. Uh, another example is, hey, saying China virus is not funny. It's actually hurtful. There's people in our community that, that impacts when you say that. It's so important that we give the words to disrupt those patterns of saying hurtful things and uh, make sure that people know it does impact emotions of students. I also wanna share some general safety information uh, for the weeks coming up. Uh, we recognize that our students have a desire to be social justice advocates and leaders. And so it's important that we let you know that your safety is our top concern. Uh, it's important that you have a talk with your family and caregiver because we all care about you and want to make sure that you're safe because there are potential dangers of deciding to make the decision to demonstrate and go to protests. We want to make sure that you understand and recognize that this is an opportunity to be peaceful and show the world change, to be mindful of our community, of students, of other peers watching. School leaders will be available to help students leave the building in an orderly fashion. Middle school students will be required to have a parent or guardian permission before being able to leave the building. You will not be able to re-enter the building once you leave. While there are no consequences for attending the protests and demonstrations, any infractions that take place while you're there will be address in alignment with school discipline policy. I hope today that you were able to learn some strategies to take care of yourself. I hope you're able to find ways to build a stronger community. And I also hope they're able to find alliance with people from different backgrounds and to help support each other. Uh, the people in the picture I have here are educators who are different cultures than me, different ages from me. Uh, and they have helped me in my journey in being an educator. Uh, Lori Bramba, Jim Birma, these two educators uh, saw my humanity and took an opportunity to get to know me. And it made a difference in them having opportunities where I could share with them what my experience has been like as one of the few educators of color in, in counseling or a few students of color in school. Uh, and so I think it's important that we are able to find that humanity in each other, get to know people of different backgrounds and hear each other and the hurts that we have so that we can move forward as a community. I wanna wrap up by saying MPS students, it's you we care about and like just the way you are. We wanna encourage you to keep finding ways to celebrate the joys in your identity. We're excited that you're back in uh, school buildings and learning and engaging. Uh, and we're excited to keep getting to know more about you and your culture and your identity and to support you in times like this. Take care, and I hope the words and messaging that we have for you today can be a starting point as we grow towards healing in the coming weeks.